Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Councilmember Robin Wonsley, and I'm the co-chair of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Um, I'll be starting this off while uh, Councilmember and Chair uh, Ellison um, makes his way to join us. Um, but that said, I'm going to call to order our regular meeting for Monday, October 31st. Wait, is this Halloween? 30th. Ah, oh, Lord. Okay, well, belated uh, post Halloween. Either way, Monday, October 31st, 2023, and I'll now have the clerk uh, call the roll. Councilmember Vita? Present. Chavez? Present. Koski? Present. Uh, Osman is absent. And Vice Chair Wansley? Present. Chair Ellison is absent. We have four present. Awesome, thank you. Let the record reflect that we do have a uh, quorum. Uh, we have 21 items on the consent agenda, which I'll now read for the record. Uh, the first is a passage of resolution for the third quarter donations uh, report. Number two is the passage of resolution for gift acceptance for local public health association of travel expenses, including registration and lodging. Number three is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from climate generation of travel expenses, including flight, lodging, and meals. Item number four is passage of resolution for gift acceptance from University of South Florida Public Health Regenerative Leadership Synergy of Travel Expenses, including flights, hotel, and meals. Number five is authorizing collective bargaining agreement with IBEW Local 292 Electrical Technicians Unit 2022 and 2023 through 2025. Number six is accepting a rebid street light installation project. Number seven is accepting bid for demolition and debris removal at Kmart site. Number eight is accepting bid for property maintenance services. Number nine is accepting bid for pavement profiling and rental of roto milling services. Number 10 is accepting bid for water and sewer service relocation. Number 11 is accepting bid for concrete sidewalks, curb, and ADA pet ramps. Number 12 is authorizing contract with Stantec Consulting Services, Inc. for engineering and design services for the First Avenue North Street Reconstruction Project. Number 13 is authorizing contract with Tolts, Keen, Duvall, Anderson Associates for engineering and design services for the Cedar Lake Road Bridge over BNSF railroad projects. Number 14 is authorizing contracts with Accenture LLP for a data management technology services. Number 15 is authorizing contract with Hennepin Healthcare System Inc. for fire emergency medical services education and training. Number 16 is authorizing contract amendment with Kimley Horn and Associates Inc. for engineering and design services for Hennepin Ave South Street Reconstruction Project. Number 17 is contract amendment with Rosedale Chevrolet LLC for General Motors OEM Parts and Service. Number 18 is authorizing a contract amendment with Clearwater Analytics LLC for various investment services. Uh, number 19 is authorizing contract amendment with Everlaw Inc. for e-discovery and redaction software. Number 20 is consenting to a lease agreement between the United States Army Corps of Engineers and Friends of the Falls for the ancillary lands around the Upper Saints, Anthony Lock and Dam. Number 21 is author, author, well, approving a legal settlement uh, for the city of Minneapolis versus uh, Leo A. Dolly and Ice Builders, the Golden Industrial Refrigeration LLC, Stantic Consultant Services, Generator Studio LLC. Um, those are all the consent items. Um, is there any discussion on a, or on these items? And I'll make sure to pass it over to our Chair Ellison. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you for getting the committee started. Uh, and apologies for being late. Um, and also for the record, I believe item 21 is us receiving uh, money, which is a rare, rare occurrence for anybody who follows uh, these settlement agreements. Um, with that, I'll, yeah, did you already make the motion uh, to move, approve the consent agenda? Oh, I asked it. Oh, okay. Question. All right. Um, all right, seeing no further questions, I will uh, move uh, the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. 
and the consent agenda is approved. Uh, I know we are now moving on to item 20. Uh, we have a receiving file, um, item 22, which is um, the uh, uh, receiving and filing the quarterly staff report for purchasing letters and joint purchases. Uh, there is no presentation, uh, and so I'll see if there's any questions on that from my colleagues. Uh, and seeing none, I'll direct the clerk to file that report. Uh, on to discussion items. Uh, item 23 is a presentation on a contract with Horseman Inc. Uh, for horse boarding services. Uh, this was an item that was postponed due to some questions from council members uh, regarding the item. And so I'll now invite staff to share a brief presentation. Do we have staff to give a presentation on this item? Thank you and good afternoon, City Council members. My name is Adrian Infante and I am the Executive Officer for the Mounted Police Unit. I am here today speaking in front of you to garner support for our boarding contract with Horseman Inc. in order to continue the high standards of health and well being for our police horses. A brief history of the unit Mounted Police Unit was established in 1992 with just four riders and three loaned officers, three loaned horses. Today we have 12 police horses and one in training and 24 certified riders. We are the last and only mounted police unit in the state of Minnesota. Mounted police has been boarding at the Horseman Inc. stables since 2007. It is located in Maple Plain, 26 miles west of downtown Minneapolis. The ranch is approximately 97 acres and includes a private police barn, 13 horse stalls, plus additional areas to store horse tack and equipment and training aids. Horses get turned out and in twice a day for their basic feed, medications, and health checks. During the grazing season, although it's short, horses roam approximately 60 acres of pasture that is sectioned off. The ranch location also has direct access to the adjoining Lake Rebecca Park that is commonly used to exercise and train the horses on its miles of horse trails. The ranch has access to an indoor and outdoor arena where additional mounted training occurs and ample space to park our heavy duty hauling trailers and police trucks. The ranch provides on-site management and a full-time barn staff that also takes care of an additional 80 plus horses that board in the ranch. Safety for the horses is paramount to us and the location of the ranch and around the clock ranch manager on site ups the level of security for our police herd. The ranch is also within the operating area for Anoka Equine Veterinary Hospital that services our horses for annual wellness vet checks and any equine vet needs. As you can see, mounted police functions include but are not limited to community engagement events such as visits to schools and elderly care facilities. Just recently, this past Friday, we visited Lucy Laney and City View. Mounted will also host barn tours to handicapped kids and special needs adults where they can experience firsthand the ranch life the horses live. High visibility patrols during late night safety plan and in all areas of the city to include hotspots where additional uniform presence is needed. Mounted has participated in recruitment events as well, recently just engaging with thousands of state fair patrons just this past summer while hosting meet and greets with officers and their equine partners at the fairgrounds. Mounted has a high visible presence during large scale events such as Vikings and Twins games, as well as concerts in the aforementioned Minnesota State Fair, where we provided an added safety to all the millions that attend those events. Mounted is the biggest walking billboard for MPD with thousands of positive contacts throughout each year, whether it be in the Mount, patrolling neighborhoods, or during late night safety plan. The abundance of genuine contacts exceeds more than any other officer on foot or in squad. Officers in the saddle are able to break down barriers much more easily due to their equine partner and initiate great conversations with citizens from all areas of the city. Mounted has had a direct impact on crime in downtown during late night safety plan. We're able to have a higher presence standing upwards to 10 feet tall, which is a natural deterrent. We're also able to see over crowds of people and can spot agitators and intervene before violence occurs. Over the past several years, Mounted has had direct contact with observing violent assaults firsthand and then arresting those responsible due to them being able to see above everybody else. The specialized unit 
is definitely a cohesive team. They have some of the best officers and sergeants the city of Minneapolis has to offer. Their level of professionalism encouraged to ride a 1,500 pound animal in an urban setting is absolutely astonishing and an achievement that goes above and beyond their call of duty. I really wish I could put into words the beauty it takes to have a horse of any size trust a human being on their back in a setting that's not natural to them and have them perform the duties of a police officer at the exact same time. I have high praise for every mounted officer for being so courageous and choosing this adventure. There's a saying, there's something about the outside of a horse that is good for the inside of a rider. What I mean by that is every member of my team can attest that the bond they have with these horses has not also made them a more compassionate police officer, but also a better father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, partner, and overall human being. The composure you must maintain and any negative attitude you must check at the barn gate is absolutely necessary in order to have a successful ride. Lastly, as you can see here, unit members have also received specialized training in large animal rescue, and have performed such tasks with great success. This large-scale training was hosted at the horse ranch and was assisted by Minneapolis Fire Tactical Rescue, and we are the only certified unit in the state that can perform these rescues. Before I thank you for my time, I want to acknowledge a couple of people that are in the audience with me today. Minnesota State Fair Chief Ron Knafla, who also has a letter from the CEO of the State Fair, Renee Alexander. If it suits you, the committee, I'd like for him to read that. Also in attendance is our several supporters that are here to show support for our renewal of our contract as well. Thank you for your time for allowing me to speak. All right. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so if you wanted to invite the uh, the State Fair Chief, sorry, am I getting the title correct? You are. Thank you. Welcome uh, uh, up. Thank you, Committee. I'll be available for any questions you might have as well. Yep. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I've been with the State Fair for 35 years, two years as Chief, and the last two years, 2022 and 2023, we had the Mounted Patrol assisting us. Times have changed and we can't police the way we used to at the fair. Um, and it takes collaboration and partnerships, which you have built with a number of state, federal, and local agencies, including the Minneapolis Mounted Patrol. With that, uh, they, they bring such value to our operation. Uh, and it's outlined in this letter from the CEO and Deputy General Manager, which I'll read to you. Dear members of the Minneapolis City Council, the Minnesota State Fair is the largest annual gathering of people in our state. The celebration that brings nearly two million guests for 12 days of fun, entertainment, competition, education, and more. To ensure that everyone has their usual outstanding experience, our number one priority must be public safety. This is a massive responsibility that requires a comprehensive plan developed and implemented in partnership with multiple agencies and experts at local, state, and federal levels. The Minneapolis Mounted Patrol Unit plays a significant role and unique role in support of this effort. As these officers move through the fairgrounds, they can skillfully and calmly disperse crowds that may start to gather, thereby reducing the potential for tension. The increased visibility of the officers on horses provides a valuable deterrent, especially in more unpredictable areas such as the entrance to the midway. Officers on horseback also provide essential eyes and ears above the crowds as if needed and, or excuse me, and if needed can move faster than patrols on foot. Just as important as the mounted patrol's key public safety role is the overwhelming, overwhelming positive interaction the unit has with our guests. Officers are approached by people from all walks of life. They answer questions, acknowledge guests, and wave and smile and they are asked to be in photos. The goodwill built between these law enforcement officers, their horses, and guests epitomizes the great Minnesota get-together. As the Minnesota State Fair continues to improve and enhance its public safety plan for years to come, we look forward to continuing our partnership with the Minneapolis Mounted Patrol Unit. And again, that's signed by Renee Alexander, the CEO, and Brian Hudala, the Deputy General Manager. And just to add, the, the 1.8 million people that attended our fair last year, 
The State Fair also has 80 full-time staff that in the summer swells to 450 staff members. And then fair time, it's 2,300 staff hired by the fair. That does not include the approximately 10,000 that are hired independently by the vendors that staff the booths at the fair. So 1.8 million, um, and there's a lot more interaction, and you could see in the slideshow, um, Sweet Martha's Cookies was a favorite of, I think, the, the staff and the horses. So um, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but otherwise, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here and, and thank you for the presentation. I think we will take questions. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to just, for the sake of discussion, uh, I know that there is the, there's the efficacy of the, of the horse program in, in its entirety, and then there's this contract that is uh, about the uh, housing the horses, correct? Do I have that? I want to make sure that we're not accidentally debating both things here. Um, yes, so, Council Chair. Okay. Um, and yeah, so this is about the housing of the, of the horses. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and I will look to my colleagues uh, for discussion and I see that we have Vice Chair Wansley with questions. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Uh, kind of following up on that question about the contract based off the RCA. So will we essentially be entering into a new two year contract? This is not paying for existing services, but we'll be looking to establish uh, a two year contract moving forward and kind of what you all's process for um, exploring other feasible options. Uh, I can answer the first one pretty easily, ma'am. Uh, yes, it's the to enter in a new two year and then to look into uh, future ones. I think I'd have to direct that question to Director Robin McPherson to help me with that one. Committee Chair, Council Member, uh, for this particular contract, we went to PRC and asked for a waiver uh, because going forward, which they granted, going forward, um, this is for a two year contract. We are looking for some other options. One of the uh, several years ago, I want to say five or six, we actually looked at building our own stable. It wasn't economically feasible at that time. Um, but we are looking at a potential longer term situation. So that's why we asked for the two year contract. Uh, one of the reasons we have, or one of the issues we have when we look for a contract for the stable specifically, is that uh, stables, one, there are not a lot available, first of all, and there are pretty much none or very few that have this type of um, amenities that this particular stable has, the security plan, as well as within a 30 mile radius or a 30 mile from uh, north and west of the city. Uh, because of commute traffic and things for, for overtime, to minimize overtime. But some of the stables are pretty reluctant to put in any kind of improvements because our contracts are too short. And so there's not uh, economic, you know, they look at it from an economic standpoint and they can't justify putting in a lot of improvements if we're only going to be there for two years. So we're hoping to move forward with property <coughs> services and look at maybe some other options, you know, maybe a longer term con contract with leasehold improvements. That's just one option, but we are looking forward to something else. Okay. And uh, Director McPherson, you probably can answer this next question too. So. Um, in thinking of the letter of support that you received from um, the State Fair CEO, essentially, um, I get that this is a service, I think that's grounded with the first precincts, or, or no? So, I, and correct me if I'm wrong here, um, DC Kingsbury, but the Mountain Patrol was traditionally housed within the first precinct as far, we saw the stable obviously, but it was under the, the control of the first precinct. That has recently changed and so going forward with the restructure that the um, chief has done, that is now under special operations and is under the command of Commander uh, Campbell. And does that mean kind of all precincts now have access to the Mounted Patrol? You know, they <laughs> always have had access to the Mounted Patrol. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, traditionally we have used them downtown primarily and then for these external events. Um, I don't think that's really going to change all that much because just of the number of horses we have, we're limited on the type of work that can be done and how much can that can be done. Um, but it does make it at least more available potentially uh, for other events. And what's the, I guess, um, vehicle for the external uh, uh, 
contractors or vendors like the state fair? Is it through a buyback program that the service is provided through or yeah? Yeah, you're exactly right. It was a buyback program for State Fair. Okay. Do we they have, they okay. came to us and asked if you know there could be our services provided. So I wasn't aware of the letter, so I can't answer anything about that. And do we have a sense of other, in addition to the State Fair uh, estimate of other vendors that have sought out um, these services via our buyback program? I think uh, DC Kingsbury might be a better person to answer that question. Yeah, thank you. Deputy Chief Kingsbury of Patrol. Um, Vice Chair, could you repeat the question a little bit more? Uh -huh. um, in addition to the State Fair, uh, do you have a sense of other additional partners or an estimate um, that has went through the buyback program to basically utilize the mounted patrol services? That is the only program that went through the buyback that I'm aware of, other than uh, community events and things like that that the city either sponsors or uh, we're asked to help out with that um, when tours come out to the barn or things like that. So that is the only financial one that I'm aware of. Okay, so like with the Lucy Laney um, event, I think that was mentioned earlier, is that uh, a process where like a public, sounds like a public school can just reach out and ask to partner with the special operations or MPD to co-host the event? Or basically how they're able to not do the buyback then? Yes, exactly. And that's something that we work through with Sergeant Infante as far as what he has available for resources, time, location, things like that to make sure that it works and meets the needs of both parties. But yes, that is something scheduled directly through that unit. Right. And I get that um, we're, for the contract, uh, the figure amount for the two year is about uh, $253,680. No, that's not it. Oh, in the amount of $136,000 in, <laughs> in uh, $80. Uh, do we have a, a sense of kind of the overall operating budget for supporting um, this patrol? I'm sorry, I don't have that information with me. I certainly can get that for you. Okay, awesome. And then last question, just a little bit more historical. I know you mentioned um, that this is the last mountain patrol program in the state. Uh, just a little context, did other cities or, or towns in Minnesota used to have these and phase them out? Like, how are we the only the lone wolves for this program? Um, so there are other county entities, county sheriffs, that have volunteer posses, uh, but they're not sworn officers. They're volunteers that have their own horses, and they'll do county fairs, um, help out with some of the county, county work that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as us, uh, yes, we are the only mounted police unit that's left in the state. Uh, other uh, government entities like Duluth, uh, University of Minnesota, uh, Park Police, I also had some beforehand. I, I don't know the reasons to why they were um, not available anymore, but they, we are, I know for sure, the last. Awesome, that's all the questions I had, thank you. Um, any other questions from colleagues? Councilmember Vita. No questions, just a couple comments. Just wanted to say thanks for being here, Infante. I never remember if you're a sergeant or a lieutenant or what it is, so I'm so sorry. But um, it was cool to see can, you can all. Can we get that for the record? So oh, we... okay. Uh, sergeant. Sergeant, <laughs> got it. Thank so you. Sergeant Infante, I know I should know that. I'm sorry. But um, it was so cool to see you all out at the state fair. You know, I had um, my time with Max and Goliath yes, at, at yes. the fair. It, 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 Max has beautiful hair. Just, I mean, absolutely gorgeous. I had a fun time, you know, just watching. It was interesting to see this year at the fair, I found so many people I was looking for because they were where the horses were. Yes. Everyone wanted to come and, you know, touch the horses and see them. And so I would bump into almost everyone I was looking for whenever I saw uh, the horses. You all did a wonderful job at interacting with folks out there, getting off the horses, talking to folks, really um, making the, when I think of community policing, the mounted patrol is 
what I think of, because I've seen you all in North Minneapolis at all kinds of national night out uh, festivals. Uh, my great niece, she was terrified of horses until she met Goliath, right? <laughs> and, and it was just like at a community event because we had um, Antenya, I may be saying that wrong too, but the officer who has Goliath or maybe, is Goliath yours? Uh, no, ma'am. We, we share all the horses. Um, we ride them differently just so we could get different uh, okay. perspectives from each horse that teaches us. So one of the other officers was just so gentle with my niece, Erin, and really alleviated a lot of her fears. And, it, and I'm sure it was a, a mixture of, you know, this man getting off this big giant horse plus this big giant horse. Mm -hmm. So I really think of you all as... A, a positive version of community policing that I want to see on the north side for sure. You know, not just um, when things are violent or something is scary, but having the opportunity to interact with young people, make them feel special, make them feel good about meeting a horse. You know, it, it, it really is something to see when you watch a person for the first time interact with a horse, especially a little kid, and maybe it's their first interaction with the police officer too. So I wanna be encouraging of this work. Not only, I think the state fair is great, but I would love to see more of this in our communities. I'd love to see more of this in Minneapolis. You know, it's good to see you at National Night Out and a lot of different community events, but the more opportunities, I'd love to see some kids be able to go out to the farm you know, some of the city kids to go out and be able to see the horses in their natural, um, you know, whatever you call it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so, I'm, you know, I support you all. I think it's great work you're doing, and I just want you to keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vita. And to speak on that, that example that you're speaking of here, Sergeant Antea had an impactful moment, too, uh, with that, and he spoke to me about it, and that, that meant a lot to him, too, to be able to introduce a horse to somebody that's never been able to touch a horse, and that's a lot for uh, my riders. They're able to see that uh, every ride consistently like that, and it's the community touch, the community engagement that we're able to provide that's really key for us. That's our biggest goal, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. I, I, I want to let the person in the background know we don't take public comment uh, without there being a posted public hearing, so I'm sorry. I don't want your shoulder to get tired there, I saw, but I saw your, ra your hand raised, um, uh, but we don't take uh, public comment without a, a noticed uh, hearing. Um, I'm, I want to, you know, it's my goal to find a way to move this forward, uh, but I also want to, um, uh, you know, be transparent about the fact that, that this program being on the chopping block has come up before. Um, people's questioning the efficacy of this program has come up before. Uh, we have these horses, we have this program. Uh, I think that as far as housing them, I, you know, my personal view is that we have a responsibility to house them uh, and, and make sure that they're fed for as long as we have them. But I, you know, I do think that it's worthwhile to engage in conversations with you know, uh, folks like myself, like Councilmember Wansley and, and others who, uh, are not so certain about you know the fact that we spend money on this program out into the future, and so I just I name that because it's not the first time that folks have that council members have had uh, you know some skepticism when it comes to the to the program, and you know hearing that we're the last one in the state is both you know sort of a testament to the strength of our program, also maybe a signal that this is a bit of an antiquated you know style of doing things, and you know you can kind of take your pick of which one is is landing on you as a as an audience member, or a community member, or a council member, um, but I do think that it's a worthwhile. Um, thing to be considered. Uh, but as far as this contract and, and, and our obligation to make sure that we have, you know, room and board for, for the horses for as long as we have this program, I think that that's, um, you know, that's something that I agree with. And so uh, I do appreciate you being here to be able to answer council members' questions. Um, uh, and I'll just, and speaking of, I'll see if there are any last comments or questions from council. Um, I am inclined to move this without recommendation unless folks want to move with approval, um, all right, seeing no comment, I'm, I'm gonna move this item without recommendation to full council. That means that the whole council will have an opportunity to vote on this item. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate the, the presentation, Sergeant. Thank you, Council Chair. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, all those in forward and forwarding without recommendation, let's say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, that item is forwarded um, and uh, appreciate the discussion. All right.
That brings us to our next item, which is a presentation related to a series of contracts with a pool of, uh, with a pool of immigration legal service providers who will be offering free immigration legal services. I'll invite Michelle Rivero, Director of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, to share her presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Ellison, Vice Chair Wansley, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michelle Rivera. I'm the director of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs for the city of Minneapolis. And I will provide a brief uh, presentation on immigration legal service contracts for um, 2023. I'd like to first start by giving a little bit of an overview of the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. This is an office that's located within the Department of Neighborhood and Community Relations and really represents a welcoming presence in the city of Minneapolis for newcomers and for individuals who are born outside of the United States. The goal of the office is to welcome and support residents in achieving lives of safety, dignity, and opportunity in the city. Um, we foster internal and external collaborations to develop welcoming policies for our city. Um, in other words, uh, policies that advance immigrant and refugee inclusion. We also host events, including events hosted on immigration-related developments and learning opportunities. Um, we also connect residents to resources, including immigration legal resources um, and immigration legal service providers in the Twin Cities area. So I'll give just a little bit of overview regarding the history of the immigration legal service support through City of Minneapolis. Um, the purpose of this funding is to increase safety and access to opportunity to individuals who are born outside of the United States because it's recognized that acquiring more um, secure immigration status is something that is directly connected to people's safety um, and to people's sense of, um, of uh, uh, prosperity and ability to access opportunity. Um, since 2017, the city of Minneapolis has dedicated funding um, funding began with an emergency allocation of $75,000 in mid-year 2017 um, that lasted through 2018 for three nonprofit immigration legal service providers, Volunteer Lawyers Network Advocates for Human Rights, and the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. In 2019, the $75,000 was made ongoing. In 2022, an additional $50,000 was added. Um, for immigration court removal proceedings, bringing the total amount of ongoing funding to $125,000. In 2022, we were able to expand to an additional legal service provider, Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. And in 2023, um, the city of Minneapolis increased by an additional $150,000 immigration legal service funding, um, one time uh, to bring funding for 2023 to $275,000. So as funding more than doubled in 2023, um, we moved to an RFP process, a request for proposals process to create greater transparency and also to have the opportunity to ask questions um, regarding current intake processes and identify where support was most needed. Um, we also consulted with cities around the country that had um, immigration legal service programs in drafting our RFP. Um, we considered organizational capacity, service delivery model, and where support was most needed. Our RFP timeline was from August through October um, and resulted in a selection of a pool of legal service providers that includes five organizations. The selected immigration legal service organizations are the Advocates for Human Rights, Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, International Institute, Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid, and Volunteer Lawyers Network. Um, these organizations uh, will be funded pending uh, council approval to offer discrete services depending on the organization. So for example, Advocates for Human Rights focuses on asylum-related work and representation. Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota handles a panoply of variety of immigration legal services, both affirmative in filing applications directly with USCIS and defensive of filing applications in immigration court removal proceedings. International Institute of Minnesota will focus on um, naturalization support to assist our over 10,000 individuals who have not yet applied for U.S. citizenship to be able to do so. 
Um, Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid will handle removal defense, so representation of people in immigration court removal proceedings. And Volunteer Lawyers Network is another organization that offers kind of kitchen sink, every type of immigration um, service. I want to quickly talk about why these contracts are so important. Um, there is some historical information regarding our immigrant and refugee population and the journey to belonging in the Twin Cities report, a report on immigrant and refugee inclusion that came out last year, accessible at webelongmsp.com. Um, this data, census data within this report is from 2019 and indicates that our non-US born population is approximately 63,000 individuals. Um, more updated census data for Minneapolis can also be accessed that shows um, breakdowns by, by nationality, uh, by city and state. And the reason why I highlight this historical information is because um, current trends show that we are witnessing a significant increase, or anticipated significant increase, in um, arrivals to our city and newcomers to our city from other countries. And if you do a very brief comparison um, even just for a few countries, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ecuador, and Venezuela, you can see a vast difference in the numbers of folks in the latest census data and then the, the numbers of individuals that we're able to access through a variety of different resources, including information uh, provided by the State Department of Health, um, information provided by the State Department of Human Services, and information that we've received directly from the Department of Homeland Security. And for the last two, Ecuador and Venezuela, I'll just um, provide this slide as well, which shows in a little bit more detail information that we've received from the State Department of, I'm sorry, not the state, the US Department of Homeland Security. <clears throat> that indicates over the course of the last three months from late July until the end of this month of October, the total number of folks expressing an intended destination in the Minnesota, Wisconsin area, and you can see the totals um, of over 5,000 folks um, total, and then there's a breakdown by nationalities where there's an approximate number of 100 people or more expressing an intended destination in our area uh, over the last week. So in closing, I'd just like to say that um, our immigration legal services are essential. They help our residents, whether new residents to the city or people who have been here for a long time, um, increase self-sufficiency, also reduces vulnerability, especially for our newest residents, uh, leads to safety, stability, and access to opportunity, um, and also as a byproduct, uh, helps to meet the workforce needs in the city of Minneapolis. Um, our selected providers offer a variety of immigration services as I very, very briefly highlighted with definite areas of focus. Um, our uh, relationships, our contractual relationships will really focus on meeting community where they're at, um, including through in-person connections and a warm referral process, not just telling people here, call this telephone number, but actually hosting events where people can meet with the legal service providers and, um, and have a conversation and move forward from there. Um, also, in contracting, we are discussing regular tracking of progress and impact of funding, so we'll be able to provide that information at the conclusion of the contract period. Um, I want to say thank you very much to the folks in NCR and procurement who have provided so much support in this process. Thank you very much also to city leaders for um, continuing creating and sustaining this uh, important program. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm happy to stand for questions. Absolutely. Uh, Director Rivera, uh, you know, I, uh, I really want to thank you. You've been a sort of army of one, so to speak, and, and, and certainly deserve increased capacity. And uh, part of the reason that uh, you know, I and others wanted to see you give this presentation is so that the public could, kind of, could understand what we are doing as a city uh, when it comes to ensuring people's rights and supporting uh, everyone who lives in our city. And so uh, I, I don't have any questions. I see some of my colleagues do, but I just wanted to make sure that um, you know that you're, the effort that you're putting in is, is, is definitely not only appreciated, but also recognized. So thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, Vice Chair Wansley. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I have to echo the same um, sentiments. Um, thank you for your work in um, continuing, um, you know, continuing the fact that Minneapolis has a resource here to support newly immigrant or newly immigrated or existing immigrant communities. Um, 
when I saw this come on our agenda, I really was excited to see this um, given, you know, the recent influxes of immigrant and refugee, um, you know, folks coming here um, and potentially the influx that we will see um, due to the ongoing genocide in Gaza that has actually resulted in now almost over 1.4 million um, people being displaced. Um, so I think it's important that, you know, not a matter of if, but when people start to arrive here in Minneapolis, it's going to be crucial that we have the services here to support um, them. So I just want to thank you for your leadership um, in, in advancing this work, but I also want to take a moment to thank my colleagues, specifically Councilmember Chavez and Councilmember Chuck Tai, who led on um, ensuring that you had additional one-time funding um, to increase these services. Um, and I really look forward to supporting this work and of course expanding it because we know the need is going to expand um, in the coming weeks and months. Um, so again, this is another opportunity. Oftentimes we're highlighted for all that we're doing wrong in this city, mm -hmm. um, especially coming to wakes of the uh, the counterterrorism grant that I'm glad we deleted recently, like this shows um, we're also taking this work serious to support our diverse immigrant communities. Um, so thank you. Um, and yeah, look forward to supporting this. Thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? Uh, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Chair Ellison. I just had a cute, uh, couple of quick questions because I've seen a growing population of folks from Ecuador in war for like a really large population. And so any opportunity I have to get resources, I'm going to try my best. So are there income limits on your services? So there, there are income limits. Um, I believe 125 to 150% of the poverty guidelines for full representation and 300% of the federal poverty guidelines for, um, I know at least one service provider offers phone consultations um, and they have a higher threshold. So there, yes, there is an income threshold and the purpose of that is to ensure that individuals who truly cannot afford immigration legal services are able to access this support. So do you help them file their paperwork and kind of see them through the full process or what actually, what is the service? Yes, ma'am. So thank you for the question. Um, uh, the city does not provide the service, and so I don't provide the service. Um, the contracts with the immigration legal service providers, the pathway would include if an individual were to reach out to the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, I can do a warm referral. I should be able to do a warm referral to the nonprofit organization. Also, we partner, we would partner the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs with the legal service organizations to host in-person events, which are also additional opportunities for the people to receive um, consultations and be connected to the providers for full representation. Okay, so you refer them to someone who could potentially help them with the paperwork. That's correct. Or through the process. That's right. Okay, so do you have a number of like who came through this resource and ended up having, you know, getting their documentation? So we have tracking data from previous years. Um, so through 2022, we do have information about the number of individuals who received legal information, legal advice, whether it be a brief consultation, whether it be a brief service or full representation in their entire situation. And moving forward, we're working to have more um, of an understanding of like if I send a certain person over to a nonprofit organization, getting that closure and understanding how that referral concluded, right? If the individual is able to get assistance, what type of assistance? And we're trying to, in terms of structuring the contracts, have that information available by the conclusion okay. of the term. Last couple questions. I guess the first part is, do you have to live in Minneapolis to receive the services? And then the second part is, could this put people at risk for being deported or any of those things because they've been identified through this service? So, um, Chair Ellison, Councilmember Vita, um, I'll, I'll answer your second question first. 
Um, there is confidentiality around the service delivery. So the nonprofit organizations that work with the individuals um, do maintain confidentiality. Um, there would be like if a person is reaching out to me first and I'm connecting them to a service provider, that is information that is in our systems, but I do not anticipate that that would pose a risk for individuals um, uh, with regard to immigration-related consequences. Um, if anything, these uh, relationships are geared to assist people in obtaining secure or more secure immigration status. And in addition to that, I just also want to say that um, that often individuals who reach out are already in immigration removal proceedings, and so many of them have already come to the attention of immigration um, enforcement representatives, and people are seeking assistance once they already have an immigration situation that they need help with. Okay, I just, I mean, I have a, a personal situation that I was dealing with with someone in my ward whose family was sent back to Ecuador because they kind of got in this process, right? Like they were looking to um, get things done legally. And, you know, she's been separated from part of her family and part of her family is still here. So I just want to make sure that we're not, um, you know, separating people from their families I or... Uh, an unattended consequence of this is red flagging people and then they're they're being separated from their families or their because the situation was clearly you know they had some other things to do at home before they could be here and they were identified through resources and the husband and the younger child is no longer here well i appreciate you sharing that and i would love to learn more about Absolutely. that situation um I, I can say that with regard to information that we have accessible, ensuring that people's privacy is maintained is of paramount importance, um, and ensuring that we are not doing anything that increases the risk that someone will have immigration issues is also of paramount importance. And I, I'm sorry, I remembered the other part of your question, which was, um, is this for Minneapolis residents only? Um, yes, it is. You know, the question about how attenuated you can get. So uh, if it relates to someone who is a Minneapolis resident, but has a family member that they are trying to help, you know, is that uh, a potential client? I, th I believe the answer to that question is yes. But um, just generally speaking, yes, this is for Minneapolis residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then just for, this is kind of for my own clarity, we have contracts like this, if I'm not mistaken, like, for example, with like Homeline, where we can direct folks, and I'll ask the attorney to correct me if I'm wrong. We we direct folk home, uh, folks. Homeline gets a lot of referrals from the city, but people aren't guaranteed a certain level of representation, right? But we know that they're going to be getting, um, you know, directed here from us. Um, and so, how dissimilar would this be from th these contracts? Be from uh, contracts that we may have with Homeline or others for other issues not related to immigration, like housing or or uh, or the like. Chair Ellison, the the the, the um, renters assistance legal contracts are maintained by CPED. Okay, they're coordinated through CPED, not through our office. Got it. Um, and so I'm I'm not entirely sure that I can speak to the similarities or the differences, but okay. I think you I mean you 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 accurately hit on the role of those um, legal services providers because the city attorney's office only represents the city enterprise itself. We are unable professionally to represent individual citizens. Um, that that's sort of a necessary component of having a more of a citizen legal outreach. And this formalizes a relationship as opposed to us just being like, uh, we don't know, call this number. So Correct. I think I appreciate Correct. that. Yep. Uh, Council Member Koski. Thank you, Chair Allison. Mr. Rivera, I just wanted to say thanks for the presentation today. Also, I just wanted to note, I believe you're a one-person team. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the thousands of individuals that you're supporting and helping, and you are one person here in the city of Minneapolis doing that work for us. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for your dedication. Thank you for that acknowledgement. It really is a group effort. You know, we are all welcomers. So, um, but I appreciate the comment. 
Can I remember Chavez? Uh, thank you, Chair Elson. And thank you so much for all your work, Director Rivero. I think this is a really great step, a really good opportunity for a lot of our residents here in Minneapolis. So just thankful for your work and CR's work and our, and our staff's work on this. If you don't mind um, emailing us, just you walked us through the five different contracts, yes. like specifically like what each contract is going to do. So for example, the advocates from human rights, I think some of them will do immigration services, but some of them do different kind of immigration services. Just for us to be able to share with our constituents of who they can contact, I think that would be really helpful. Sure. And um, again, <laughs> echoing what my, my colleague, Councilor Kossi, said, we know you're <laughs> one staff department and, or office, and um, as we head into the budget, we know that this is an office that needs a lot of support. So thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, I'm gonna move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. And that item is approved. Uh, and so thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Clerk's Office, to really appreciate the assistance in helping to get this move forward. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Thank you again. Uh, with that, we've concluded all business before the committee today. And if there's no objection, we are adjourned. <laughs>